Chapter 1. A London History Dinner. An apt phrase coined in Parliament. Peculiar services to Great Britain officially recognized. The records of British Parliament of July 21st, 1921, furnished the account of the colloquy. Mr. T. Thompson arose in his seat in the Commons and asked the Prime Minister, quote, Are you aware of the costly repast given at government's expense in the Savoy Hotel Friday, July 15th to the Anglo-American professors of history? If so, will you kindly state the actual per guest of the dinner? Are you aware that many of the American guests considered the parade of expensive refreshments to be quite unnecessary in view of their nation's attitude on this matter? Will you consider if greater economy can be exercised at all hospitality functions in the future in view of the urgent need of the national economy? In reply to these questions, a government official speaking for the executive in this case said, The honorable gentleman who administers this fund is reluctant to publish cost sheets of government entertainments, which vary in scale, character, and cost, but he is quite willing to meet any honorable members interested in the subject and explain the actual outlays. But he does not share the opinion that the recent entertainment of the Anglo-American professors was extravagant. Mr. Thompson retorted, Is the honorable and gallant gentleman aware that the opinion of this extravagance is one formed by many of the guests? Mr. McQuiston added, Will the honorable gentleman observe the statement that their view was that the parade of expensive liquid refreshments was quite unnecessary in view of the national attitude on this matter? He says nothing in their personal attitude. I'm reminded of the Scottish magnate, a teetotaler who was found drinking champagne at a deputation and said it was purely local business. Who and what are Anglo-American professors of history is unfortunately not stated in the record of Parliament. Quote, Anglo-American professors of history is a peculiar term, unknown perhaps to some of us here, but appearing to be well understood by members of British Parliament. Let us hope that we also may acquire some idea as to just who and what are Anglo-American professors of history the processes through which they are created, and ways in which they function. More than a hundred, quote, Anglo-American professors of history from this country attended the London History Dinner, several of whom were soon to become identified as authors of Anglo-American history textbooks since in use in the public schools of the United States. Quote, American history, as we have been used to calling it in these textbooks. But the British Parliament, more knowingly, as early as 1921, clearly must have recognized them as Anglo-American textbooks. In the period between 1918, when the World War ended, and 1921, when the London History Dinner was given, practically all of our school histories were necessarily reprinted in order to include the story of the war. Several of the authors took advantage of this opportunity to make extensive alterations in their account of the causes and conduct of the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and other Anglo-American differences, with the avowed purpose of fostering Anglo-American accord. Under the specious plea of promoting quote, mutual understanding with Great Britain, some of these revisionists boldly defamed or ignored heroic figures in the founding of our republic, misrepresented the ideals and causes for which they struggled and sacrificed, and grossly misrepresented the ideals and principles upon which were established our liberties and our nation. There is a striking significance in the uniformity with which these revisionists proclaimed their purpose to rewrite American school history from a new viewpoint. That they were all subject to the same influences becomes apparent in a comparison of their statements in the prefaces. Professor Muzi's introduction explained the change standpoint thus, quote, The present volume represents the newer tendencies in historical writing. Its aim is not to tell over once more the old story in the old way, but to give emphasis to these factors in our national development, which appeal to us most vital from the standpoint of today. Professor McLaughlin and Van Tyne announced the new method. Quote, we make no apology for the omission of many of the yarns of American history. Quote, by means of this elimination, we have secured space for fuller explanation and interpretation of really important events. Professor C. H. Ward, in his preface, assumes the same standpoint. As long as there lurks in the back of the American consciousness a suspicion of English tyranny in 1775, so long will misunderstandings prevent the English-speaking nations from working in accord to develop Anglo-Saxon freedom. Professor A. B. Hart declared his purpose was to present adequate treatment of certain topics which hitherto have been little stressed in the study of American history. The European background of our history is clearly sketched with due recognition of our inheritance of language, law, and political methods from England. Due attention is also paid to other influences from overseas. In announcements by Professor W. B. Guiteau's history, it is declared, This book has been written in light of the recent events in which a new atmosphere has been created for the study of our national life. 
the Revolutionary War and subsequent Anglo-American difficulties hitherto distorted in our school books as a result of national prejudice have been restated by Dr. Gutierrez. Professor Willis M. West, also true to this type, and perfectly in harmony with the new spirit and methods of alteration and the anglicization of American school history, declared in his preface that the first purpose was to emphasize the historical grounds for friendship between America and England, in spite of old sins and misunderstandings. Throughout, I have not hesitated to portray the weaknesses, blunders, and sins of democracy. These and other authors of school textbooks all proclaimed the one viewpoint and argued from the one attitude, with unison of ten automations worked with one wire. Innumerable drastic alterations having been effected in ten American school histories in full accordance with this clearly declared purpose, and the books having been widely accepted into our public school system of our country, sponsored by college presidents and professors, unprotected by schoolmen, unnoted by the public, our, quote, Anglo-American professors of history were invited over to England for a celebration of their achievement, for a Fourth of July jollification, and there were dined and wined at the expense of the British government in such degree of gratitude as to provoke protest in Parliament at the extravagance. Not that these professors of history had sold their American birthright for a mere parliamentary mess of pottage. It was by no means so simple a process as that. Multiform and seductive pro-British propaganda influences which had been effectively operating upon them are to be analyzed in detail later in these pages. When these historians returned to us, many of them were boasting English college degrees. Many of them were be-ribboned with British decorations, bestowed not for valorous service to their own country, but for the betrayal of it, and all of them bearing the brand of the Parliament as the Anglo-American professors of history. We have in our midst, for instance, Professor Albert Bushnell Hart, Professor Charles Downen Hazen, and Professor William Roscoe Thayer, Knight of the Order of the Crown of Italy, in the Order of Saints Mauricio and Lazaro, Scholastic kites, thus amply tailed, with one attached string, skillfully tensioned, are sailing high and serenely as Anglo-American historical authorities. If frequent use is now made of this peculiarly expressive phrase, Anglo-American professors of history, it must be borne in mind that it is not of any base coinage, but it is officially the coinage of the British Parliament.